Well, hello, Shoreline. Uh, we're glad to be able to be together to have a time where we can pray and think and even uh, work through a song together as a means of worship while we are uh, away from one another. It's a tough time to be away, but it's an opportunity for us to be together, at least uh, through God's word. I just want to share a couple of prayer requests. One of the things that we're doing as a church is praying for uh, different groups of people through this time. Uh, we had a, a group of people that we were praying for this week, among the many of uh, healthcare workers and those who were on the front lines. We got some uh, words of encouragement back from some of those folks in our church. I just wanted to read them to you from one saying, thank you, we're so blessed. We're here with the staff at Hillcrest and they have a servant's heart for their patients. Uh, another said, thanks for reaching out to comfort for, for me because our church family is praying for us in the middle of these unsettling times. For those who are a part of the Cleveland healthcare system, everyone is tired right now, but uh, we are clinging to the Lord during this time. And uh, lastly, from another one in our church, I really miss our times of corporate worship and prayer and really look forward to the day when all of this is a bad memory and we can meet together to lift up praise to our Savior and God. And as we think about that, we're praying not only for those on the front lines, different groups of people, but also for those in our church that have been uh, adversely affected. Uh, by this in terms of being uh, having a sense of isolation, being away from others because of being at higher risk. And so as a church, we're just working our way through groups that are in those categories, and we're praying for those who are above the age of 60, even 70. And so we're putting together lists of people like this uh, that we will pray through faithfully, and we want you to be a part of that as well. So as we think about uh, those groups that are on the front lines, we think about uh, groups of people inside our church that are at risk, and we think about, too, reaching out to those who are in need at our church and outside of our church. Uh, let's go to the Lord together to pray. Our Father, this morning, we think about uh, this difficult time that we're in. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we have the opportunity to lift up those who are on the front lines, that you will just cause us to remember uh, those folks today. Lord, we pray for those in the healthcare field so give them clear thinking that you will give them wisdom as they walk through each and every day. We pray, Lord, that you'll give them also opportunity to, to pray and be a light, to be a witness, to calm fear, and to bring a sense of goodness and cheer to the hearts of those uh, that they are ministering to during this time through health care. Father, we as well think about those in our congregation that are at a higher risk, those who may be a little bit more isolated or feel that sense uh, acutely, uh, this morning. And we pray, Lord, for those who are uh, just working their way through those fears, that you will uh, call them to cast their cares upon you. Lord, we pray that for all of us, but we pray for those, especially during uh, this time. And Lord, we think about as well um, the opportunities that we have to serve others outside of the church, that you'll help us to see, again, the fields that are ripe for harvest, the opportunities that we have to be among people who may be asking questions for the first time or as life is slowing down, uh, to think with those who are contemplating bigger issues, maybe that they've never contemplated before. Help us, Lord, uh, to see these opportunities, to seize on them, and to give us wisdom as we think with those uh, who desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Pray that this morning, Lord, as we come to our time of worship in Jesus' name. We don't have a chance this morning to be able to sing together and to be together in song, but one of the things that we wanted to do was to think about a song together and maybe have an opportunity that we don't normally have in worship where we can just break down a song and think through the lyrics of it. So the one that I chose for this morning was Be Thou My Vision. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's a favorite of many, and it go comes from, I think, the 8th century. There was a, an Irish Celtic poet that wrote the lyrics of the song. It was translated in uh, the early 20th century into uh, a form in which we now sing. And it's even said that perhaps the earliest author perhaps was going to suffer a, a kind of blindness and was anticipating losing sight. And as a reaction to uh, the loss of sight, or at least the anticipation of it, that uh, God would be uh, their vision. And as we think of that uh, this morning, I just want to think with you through some of the lyrics of the song. That's a real focus on the all-sufficiency of God. It's a, it's a refocusing on his greatness. And I think at a time like this, there's no better time to refocus our, our vision on the greatness and majesty of God. First verse says, of course, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. 
not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. And there's just a sense of the constancy of God's presence as it comes through in this hymn. Paul reminds us in Philippians 3, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I think that sense of the worth of knowing Christ, our Lord, comes through. That even losing everything else, that the greatest gain that we have is, is knowing him, knowing his presence. Verse 2, be thou my vision, O thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father, thine own may I, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. This just the sense of the indwelling presence of God, and the constancy of his presence, not only in the world at large, but also inside our own souls, and what that really means to us as we think about his power being manifest in us. We've been thinking about that a lot as we have been going through the book of Acts, and now we think about it even in this song. As we go into verse 3 of Be Thou My Vision, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. I think this is a time where we're thinking about the things that we treasure the most as it relates to the people that we're close to and the time that we spend. But what this verse reminds us of is that the greatest treasure that we have is the treasure of God's presence uh, in us, with us, through us. And so even from the 6th century to uh, the 21st century, we're reminded of the value of God's presence in our life, especially at a time like this. Of course, the last, uh, the last verse, the crescendo, High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. And really, that is the vision of all of eternity, where Christ is reigning. And we look forward to that time where we will be with him during that reign. Until that time, uh, we think about his reign in our hearts now. And so we think about the victory won. We think about uh, what he accomplished at the cross and the resurrection. And hopefully it causes this morning our hearts to sing that together. And as we listen to the song being performed now.
Good morning, Shoreline. I just thought I would think with you for just a few minutes on Philippians 1, 12 to 18, as we think about the time that we're living in, the opportunity that God has for us, uh, given this uh, difficult time. Philippians 1, 12, Paul begins, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Well, friends, I just reminded, I was just reminded by uh, Megan Bogart's video that we have up on our YouTube channel of the opportunities that take place during times like these, and one of the things that she had reminded us of is that as patients come by her throughout her days, that there are these opportunities to be able to pray for people, and while uh, they may not be taken every single time, Just the thought occurred to me that the opportunities there are vast, and especially during a time like this, it seems like there could be opportunities there for the taking for us as we think about uh, the fact that things have slowed down and people are asking questions. And my mind went to Philippians chapter 1, just in Paul's reminder, not only to the Philippian church, but I think to us as well, that while there are, of course, times of bad news, that the good news can still transform in the midst of the bad. And that's really, I think, kind of the point this morning. In the midst of the bad times, the bad news, the good news is still out transforming people's lives. So I just thought, maybe just in a couple of tracks this morning, how out of the bad news, the good news transforms. Just look at the first couple of verses here in verses 12 to 14. One of the things that we notice here is that Paul is in prison. Well, how did he get there? Well, One of the ways in which I think God totally defies our logic and expectations that he takes at times the most unlikely people and he puts them in a position to be used for his glory. And that was Paul. Paul was uh, a killer as it related to his previous life before he had met Christ. He thought he was doing everything in accordance with God's will. And what was actually happening was that he was working against God's will. He was trying to stamp out the church before he actually came to know who God was. In fact, He thought he was uh, advancing a greater cause, but he was really um, distancing himself from it. God got a hold of his life in a pretty dramatic way. He met met the Lord on the Damascus Road, and that's when he came to that that life-changing realization that he needed to be forgiven by Christ for his sins. Once he came to that realization by faith, his life went on a completely new track, and he became a servant of God and the gospel. And his service to God and the gospel took him to some pretty amazing places, some of which we wouldn't really have expected. One of them here in this passage is to the place of imprisonment. Now again, if I were writing the script, I would think, you know, this is not exactly where I want my best spokesperson to go, into prison at a time when the church is really starting to grow and the gospel is really taking off as it relates to all these different people groups. Paul goes into prison. Now why would God put him there? In all of the vast resources of God's wisdom, I can't say for sure, but what we can learn from a passage like this is that there is a new opportunity now for Paul to be able to preach in the prison. So as we think about a passage like this, I think there's two things that come out of Paul's recognition of where he is. Yeah, it's a bad place being in prison, but the good news is still transforming. One of the things that we realize from this, one piece of good news in the midst of this, is that there's opportunity in the midst of the difficulty. You see this happening over and over and over again. It wasn't where Paul was supposed to go. It wasn't up to him. Paul was a servant of God, and he was a servant of the gospel. Where he went was up to God. And so God sent him into prison for a season of time. But once he goes into prison he realizes that's now his new place to rest and to speak. It becomes an opportunity. What you see here in the passage then in the second second place, in verse 14, 
is that there is now this renewed confidence on the part of all the people who are outside of prison, but who are tracking with his movement. So in verse 14, it says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, just think about this. Paul is in prison. He's in a kind of quarantine. And you would think that in this newfound situation where he's away from his friends, he's absent from being able to see them, that this would uh, decrease confidence, that it would increase fear. But just the opposite happens. As Paul sees this opportunity now to preach the entire prison, all of the confidence level starts to go up on the part of those brothers and sisters in Philippi. It's pretty amazing how God does this. As people begin to realize there is a newfound opportunity for the gospel, their confidence goes up. It's not as if God's plans are thwarted. In fact, they're being fulfilled. It's, it's counterintuitive in the way we think about it. But the confidence in what God is doing can actually increase during a period of separation. It's pretty amazing. Now, I, I hope you can see where I'm going with this. We're living in the midst of a, a pandemic, and the fear level is increasing on a daily basis. But what's the response for us as believers? Now, without getting too crazy here, I just thought of this in this way that there now are these newfound opportunities that we have as Christians that we may have not had before. I mean, think about it. In our society, we're normally racing around from one thing to the next, and oftentimes we may talk about at-risk people or people who are in social isolation, and we might think of some other time where we might be able to help out. Well, now on a whole societal level, we're, we're being asked to watch out for those in social isolation. We're, we're being told to, that we need to care better for those who are in at-risk situations. This is all coming from all around us into society, and it's now creating a great opportunity. The question is for Christians, how do we think about it? Or if you think about it this way, that there's a renewed confidence in what God is doing. How could we, our confidence be renewed when we're being asked to stay away from everyone? Well, one of the things that's happening now is everyone is slowing down. Instead of all the hustle and bustle and movement, people are now asking bigger questions about life and death and what should we do? What is our response? I thought of just a few conversations I've had recently where we're not having conversations about sports or politics or what's happening with the economy or anything like that. We're talking about life and the, f the fragility of our health and you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. All these really basic questions for us as human beings now, we're starting to have these conversations. Sometimes these are just the barriers that we have to get past as it relates to those talking, you know, opportunities that we have with people. But now everything is slowed down and given us the opportunity just to get to what's real with our neighbor. Now, as I was thinking about it, life change often happens through the bad times. Life change happens and transformation happens when maybe we go through some of the most difficult periods of time in our lives. And I wanted to just play or at least I wanted to share some short testimonials with you from people who had gone through the bad news only to see the good news transform. So take a listen. The bad news was just before my sophomore year in college, I injured my right knee before the basketball season. I was on an athletic scholarship. Resulted in a surgery. I also ran track and just before the track season, re-injured my knee which resulted this time in a reconstruction surgery of my medial lateral collateral, but I also had a torn anterior cruciate. That resulted in two more surgeries, which ended up ending my athletic career, which was devastating because it was my life. It was my identity. Uh, again, I was religious. I spoke in churches, but I wasn't a Christian. I was doing for God. I thought I was a Christian. And, uh, and it was God used this to bring me to end to myself. But the good news God answered my prayer and did bring me to end myself. And on a beach in Corpus Christi, I heard the gospel again. And this time, I understood it and came to trust in Christ. And my life's been different ever since. Bad news is that one morning I was laying on the ground outside and felt my life coming to an end. The good news is that this experience showed me that I needed God in my life and I needed him to guide me and protect me um, 
he showed me that I could not do this alone on my own and that I needed him. God put people in my life that prayed and helped me and guided me in the right direction. So bad news. Yeah. The bad news is there was a time where um, it was a really dark time and it was a troubling time. Um, I was in an abusive relationship. It was verbally, mentally, physically abusive, and then in the midst of an eating disorder. And I remember feeling like I was in this pit. I was stuck and I couldn't get out. And then I remembered my faith in Christ. I was taught as a little girl um, growing up in the church. And that was the very thing that I turned to. And I cried out to the Lord and he heard my cry and he set my feet on the rock and he is the rock. And it's been that way ever since. So hopefully from just those little testimonials, it's become more clear to you that through the most difficult of times, the bad news, if you like, some of the ways in which God works through the good news becomes that much more prominent. You can see that here in the passage as well. But then there's a second part here for the bad news, yet the good news emerging in, in Paul's uh, letter here to the Philippians in verse 15. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So what's, what's he saying here? Well, what he's saying is, is that there are going to be some people who act uh, poorly, or there's going to be some bad actors, whatever the case is. He's happy that Christ is still preached. In other words, through some of these difficult times when he goes to prison, yes, there's going to be people who do things that he'd rather them not do. But as long as Christ is truly preached, that is what his greatest hope is. Now, if you think about it, during periods of crisis, some people are going to act uh, in a way to better themselves at the expense of others. And we're even seeing that at some level today. I, for whatever reason, there's been this um, run on toilet paper. And I brought one <laughs> roll, just one very important, valuable roll of toilet paper as an illustration. But uh, you see people on the news, and maybe you've seen them at the local Giant Eagle, you know, with reams of toilet paper hanging out of their cart. And I, I'm not totally sure um, maybe what the fear is. Maybe they're going to spend the entirety of the coronavirus period on the toilet. I don't know. But the, the point is, is that people might act differently during a time of crisis than in what they would normally act. And Paul saw the same thing happening. In fact, um, here, some people started to preach Christ and really elevate their platform, really at the expense of Paul's ministry. And one of the things that he recognized was that it really wasn't about him. It wasn't about the elevation of his own ministry. In this time, this time period, he recognized it was about the elevation of Christ. And so one of those things that you see, I think, as a transformational element in a passage like this is that even in this time of crisis, making sure that we understand it's really about the elevation of Christ in the gospel, and it's really not about us as individuals. Now, it's hard because we start to focus in on ourselves, and everybody to some degree is kind of hunkering down and wondering about life and where their life is going, and I totally understand that. But one of the good reminders that Paul gives us here is that even though people may be acting in a poor way, it's still about the preaching of Christ as the ultimate. There's plenty of things to get upset at, trust me. I mean, I watch the news too, and there's been reports that you know, have been annoying or even infuriating about some of the things that people are doing. But I have to remember that some of those same things exist in my own heart. I mean, yeah. I, too, was a guy pushing around a cart at Giant Eagle and Target and kind of wondering about, do I have enough? I was thinking about what was in someone else's cart and, you know, even to some degree, do they have something that I should have? And there's just part of this that just naturally happens in our lives during crisis times like this. And so I don't think any of us are immune from the fact that we're going to be a little bit more self-focused during a time like this. But one of the things Paul reminds us of is to lift up Christ, to keep our focus on him. And as we do so, that I think that there's a transformational element. How the good news is transforming us in the midst of the bad news and the difficult times. Now, as we think about the, the finality of this passage, 
He says something at the very end that's, I, again, even more counterintuitive than the rest. At the very end of the passage of verse 16, he says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, f- just think about that for a second. Paul is in prison. He's thrown in there unjustly. Who knows what people are thinking about him outside the church? The church knows why he's there. But he's saying that even in the midst of some people even preaching in a way that would not be the kind of way that he would want them to preach, in all these things, Christ is proclaimed and I rejoice. So what in the world is he rejoicing in? Well, I don't think he's rejoicing in the pain per se. I mean, being in prison, people acting badly, all that type of thing. Not, not the pain itself, but it's, it's what the painful circumstance is actually producing. And what's it producing? Well, it's producing greater opportunity for the gospel to go out. Now he's been able to sit in front of guards and other prisoners and speak the gospel. It's emboldened other Christians now. So there's a result that's happening through a circumstance that they would have never chosen that now God has uh, authored. And in that uh, circumstance, or in that result of what's happening through that circumstance, Paul says, I can rejoice. Now, we get to a circumstance like the one that we're in. We don't rejoice in the actual pain of what's happening with the coronavirus, other people's pain. That's not what we're rejoicing in. But we can rejoice if we start to think of it as Christians, like there are opportunities now, newfound opportunities that we can use as believers to be able to speak to those around us, to be able to help out, to be able to take the opportunity maybe we haven't had before to reach out to a neighbor or to pray with someone or ask someone if they need Uh, something to be prayed about. All these things God is using now for us as believers to be able to clear a pathway so that he might be proclaimed. It's my hope that as we think about this together in the midst of the bad news, the good news transforms, that wherever we are, whether we are feeling in that that sense, you know, isolation, whether we're uh, in a different situation, that we can see that God has something for us here. He has a way of transforming us through our circumstances. He did so with Paul here, giving him opportunity, giving him a sense of renewed confidence with his brothers and sisters. Even through uh, the bad actors, he gave them the opportunity uh, to proclaim the gospel. And I think that that opportunity exists for us today. Well, Shoreline, I hope that you have a good morning. I hope to see you soon and stay tuned for all the updates that we have coming up.